totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock online at bookedonrock.com. Find every episode there, audio, video, exclusive video segments from episodes, got a blog, latest rock book releases, and a whole lot more at bookedonrock.com. It's the return of Martin Popoff. His latest book is Judas Priest, album by album. Martin pays tribute to Judas Priest's discography through a series of in-depth and fascinating conversations about all 19 of the legendary British heavy metal band Studio Albums. He gathers together musicians and metal journalists who offer insights, opinions, and anecdotes about each release. The interviewees include names like Slash, Marty Friedman of Megadeth, Charlie Benanti of Anthrax, Todd LaTorre of Queensryche, Bobby Ellsworth of Overkill, and more. Find a playlist of Judas Priest in this episode's show notes. Welcome back, Martin. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Eric. We're recording this on 11-11, which apparently is National Metal Day. Oh, who's who's okay. more metal than Judas Priest, right? And, and Remembrance Day up in Canada, right? Which I think is different from, uh, from when the States. So let's get to the book. You write, constructing this book was about the most fun I've ever had in a Priest title because I got to share that wonder with a bunch of like-minded buddies, some of them accomplished rock stars in their own rights, and what these guys have accomplished through 50 years as metal gods. Tell us what's inside the book. Yeah, the idea here is that uh, this is a, a reprisal of the of the great uh, series that we did with Quarto Motor Books and my buddy Dennis Pernu over there, my editor, um, you know, quite a few years ago where we did panel books like this, where I go, you know, interview a bunch of people on every studio album. And, and back then we did Pink Floyd, we did Queen, Rush, ACDC, uh, Iron Maiden. And so this is, uh, yeah, full color throughout, hardcover, beautiful design as usual from those guys. And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole premise back when we started this idea was, uh, yeah, try to get some rock stars in there. And then also, uh, you know, some, some good, uh, you know, some journalist buddies of mine uh, who can tackle some of the things you're not going to dare asking rock stars to do. Like, you're not going to say, go away and do your homework and we're going to talk about Nostradamus and uh, demolition, right? Uh, kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it was nice. We got Slash, which is excellent. Charlie Benanti, Devin Townsend, Danko Jones, uh, Blitz. Uh, Marty Friedman's in there, ex Megadeth, of course. I don't, I, I hear he doesn't like to be called ex Megadeth, but um, yeah. I'm sorry about that, Marty. Um, and um, Chris Caffrey, yeah, a bunch of, bunch of cool rocker uh, buddies, and uh, and also, um, like I say, some some journalists that I know know their priest uh, really well. We got Pete Pardo in there for Sea of Tranquility, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's been a lot of fun doing this and going through all these priest albums because you know all those rockers. I mean, there was no more, uh, you know, light bulb moment for uh, if you were going to become, say, a thrash artist in the 80s. Uh, there was no no more light bulb important super band than uh, than Judas Priest, you know, starting with the great Sad Wings of Destiny, basically their second album. That's where I was going to go. How far back do you go as a fan of Priest? Well, I go back. Uh, I'll never forget the day, um, but it was with Sad Wings of Destiny. So I was 13, 1976, just saw me and my buddies were down at the record store and you see this album. And and I remember looking at it and thinking this could be a Christian rock album, uh, you know, with that album cover, the name Judas Priest, Sad Wings of Destiny on the back. It almost looked like um Rob Halford was holding up a cross, um, you know, all the religious writing, all the song titles were like super religiously sounding victim of changes, dreamer, deceiver. And it was all in, in the religious writing tyrant. Everything sounded super old and medieval. Right. Um, and I remember thinking this, this could be, hopefully it could be good. Uh, it could be metal, uh, but this could be not metal at all. Uh, even though, you know, it looks like these guys are rocking out and they got long hair and stuff, but you know, who would have thought it would have been that incendiary and advanced and uh, and super heavy metal? I mean, I I've always said that um, it doesn't reinvent anything. It's it's no new reinvention. Just like Iron Maiden's no reinvention of anything either. Um, you know, there are a lot of great albums that are not a reinvention. Sabotage, Sirens, Merciful Fate, uh, Melissa. And, uh, yeah, a lot of great albums are just better versions of what came before. Sad Wings is like that as well. But I've all, always said that metal gets invented in 1970 and then 
just a bunch of good metal shows up. And then, and then in 1976, I always call this the Richter blip where, where it improves vastly. There's just a, there's just, everything's better about this. The lyrics, the vocals, the production's pretty good on it. And especially the riffs. Um, just, it just, there, there's just this uptick in, uh, in quality and, uh, you know, intellectual value, whether that's just, just straight musical intellectual value or, or like I say, the, the lyrics, or like I say, the singing kind of thing. So, so yeah, metal, metal comes out, it cruises along. Uh, and then this is, this is the first great next, uh, absolute masterpiece of a metal album. So, so basically 70 to 76, you know, I mean, my favorite album of all time shows up in there. Uh, Sab- Sabotage and Physical Graffiti shows up. But um, I think from 70, uh, it basically goes 70 and then 76 is is the next milestone. Interesting history to Judas Priest. They go back to the late 60s. And Rob Halford wasn't the original singer. He's on all the albums or, well, at least until he's out of the band, but he's on all the early albums. How and when did they form? Who's the original? Line? Yeah, very much, very much. Uh, they have tons and tons of different people in the band. They, they're like, I did a uh, history and five songs with Martin Popoff episode on Judas Priest and Russia's doppelgangers. And uh, the interesting thing is that they both started in 69 and they both had their first album in 74. Right. Um, and uh, and Rush had some different lineups, but not as much. But Priest was constantly changing. You know, there's n- no originals kind of thing. Um, you know, KK wasn't there at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, Glenn is a super late arrival. He's even later than Rob, but Rob's arriving in 73. I think I think Glenn is arriving in, I don't know, late 73 or early 74, something like that from the Flying Hat Band. But the mainstay of the band uh, all through that time is Al Atkins. He's the vocalist, the leader of the band through that time. They, they tour a lot um, up and down England, uh, you know, famously playing with Budgie and all these different bands all the time. And they're, they're writing songs. They got quite a few original. Originals. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the Al Atkins writing shows up on Rockerola and a little bit on Sad Wings, right? Um, but yeah, they have tons and tons of lineup changes all through that time. I believe they balloon even up to uh, to the five piece, but I think that at some point they are a three piece. Um, so um, yeah, they're just kind of a local band doing good, trying trying to get somewhere, and then they get this small record label, and they're and they're off to the races. They they put the two albums out on on Gull Records with Al Atkins. What happened? They just weren't happy with the direction they were going in with him, or vice versa. Did he leave? I think it's more or less a vice versa. He 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 just got um, fed up with the lack of success of the band, and uh, and just because he was totally the leader of the band, so he he just basically says I, i'm out guys you know do do what you want to do kind of thing and what and became they, of him in later years uh he he kind of left the business but in later years he had some solo albums out that are actually really good um so yeah he's he's a good talented guy um and he was always a good supporter of the band super nice guy yeah um, you know did interviews and stuff over the years and uh was, is, is a is a big part of the story it's true that the name judas priest comes from a bob dylan song that- yeah, the ballad of Frankie, what's his name, and Judas Priest kind of thing. Yeah, it's just a weird, you know, they just picked it up from that. I always I always thought it was a strange name where, uh, yeah, it's obviously there's a little bit of the, you know, the two name thing, the Deep Purple, and especially the Black Sabbath, where Black Sabbath, you got the good, the, the evil and the, you know, the evil and the pure, the the black and the white in there. And Judas Priest, I guess, kind of feels that way. Judas the Betrayer and all that. You got Priest. So, yeah, it's a it's a strange name, right? It's uh, it's just yeah, it's you don't it's 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 two words stuck together. You know, one is a name. One is a descriptor. You put a name in front of a descriptor. I never really thought about it, but it's it's a funny, funny name of a band. And it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue very great, very well either. And uh, like I say. I mean, you, you would be, you know, you wouldn't be uh, remiss to uh, just think it's going to be like a Christian rock band of some sort. What does that first Priest album, Rockerola from 74, sound like? And what was the consensus of the people that you spoke with in the book? Because you draw comparisons to Thin Lizzy on a few tracks. I, I thought I heard maybe a Deep Purple type of sound. Yeah. Um, one of the you tracks. Know, it's, uh, Pete Pardo said this, and I, I agree, uh, or I said it, and he agreed. I can't remember, but um, the fact of the matter is, if uh, Judas Priest never made another album after Rock and Roll, that would have been considered one of those great lost heavy metal classics, right? But because everything that came after was just such a vast improvement, 
um, you know, we, we tend to forget this record, but, uh, you know, KK says uh, something really interesting about it. He calls it progressive blues. He, he says we were looking for uh, a sound that nobody had. Uh, he, he kind of really is one of the first guys that kind of nails this, uh, this greatness of, of uh, Judas Priest in, in articulates. And, and essentially he, he, he said, yeah, it was like a progressive version of the blues. Um, but uh, it's essentially early heavy metal. You know, I, I, um, I often liken it to uh, basically being like a demo version of Sad Wings of Destiny. It's not, it's not as bad as the band thinks it is. I don't even think it's recorded as the band thinks it is. They never liked the recording. And thus, we've got this, uh, this new uh, meticulously, meticulously remixed version of it, which is really cool. Tom Allen was involved with that. But yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good quality, professional sounding heavy metal album, especially for a baby band on a budget. Um, it it is very capable. I think it's much more capable than you know the the much lauded Bang and Sir Lord Baltimore type records that you hear. Even Captain Beyond sounds dated. It doesn't sound particularly dated for seventy four. It's kind of moving ahead. Uh, it it's uh, if anything. It's, uh, you know, all the, that confusion with the little song parts and stuff. It sounds a little bit, uh, we don't know what direction we want to go in. So it's a little bit proggy and it's a little bit heavy at the same time. You say, quote, as far as I'm concerned, the band's run of late 70s records from Sad Wings of Destiny to Killing Machine is the best example in rock history where a band was operating so far ahead of anybody else, objectively speaking. Only one band comes close and that's Queen. Yeah, I totally still believe that to this day. Um that uh, that is just this this stroke this run of genius that you get out of uh, those two bands um and i just think uh the riffs were so ahead of everything else uh the performances the complexity uh the parts that they put in uh you know something that i believe it's uh sh- is it sean kelly or is it andy black sugar points out i i always always forget who said this priest is really 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 good at doing pre-choruses and uh, so their pre-choruses were good. Their breaks were good. They often changed up the music they were doing. Uh, just just the the ideas that they had packed into those albums like Stained Class and Killing Machine and Sin After Sin were, you know, it's progressive metal too, right? Rush gets the credit for inventing progressive metal. While Priest is, uh, Priest is more metal, obviously, than Rush, but it's really progressive at the same time. They cover a Fleetwood Mac song on Killing Machine, Green Manalisi with the two-pronged crown. Yeah. Had you heard the Fleetwood Mac version prior to Priest's version? Because it's no, a pretty I obscure had, song. And, and yeah, that that it was I. That's a fond fond memory for me as well because uh, my buddy Forrest Toop got the Killing Machine album, the UK version, with with the title in red and it's Killing Machine, and it didn't have that on it. And we lived with that for a couple or a few months and just loved that album to death. It was one of our favorite albums of all time. And then all lo and behold, the North American version comes out. It's got an extra song on it, just like the sex pistols with submission. Right. Um, and you know, uh, it had this crazy shocking title. I don't even think we were aware that it was a cover when we saw it, uh, the first time quickly, we see the credits and the amazing thing about it is, is, uh, it's just a, a completely total heavy metal song uh, the way priests do it. It's, it sounds like uh, it's, it's, it absolutely stands head and shoulders with the other songs on that album. You don't even really recognize it as a cover because it's so priest. Um, and, and, you know, now I've heard the original obviously. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's just kind of a, a quiet doomy bluesy song right but but an interesting choice for a cover interesting that those albums don't have any big hit singles those are still to come on 1980s british steel which has living after midnight breaking the law a number four album in the u.s you say in the book that the band enters this album and the new decade completely transformed yeah so i remember when british steel came out we were kind of shocked at how they kind of dumbed down um still loved it um but uh yeah hearing living after midnight on radio with those louis louis chords uh, and then breaking the law and then really feeling that the two fastest songs on the album, Steeler and rapid fire weren't very good. They, the riffs, there's nothing to the riffs. They were just too simple. I weren't particularly happy with your, you ain't too old to, to be wise, whatever it's called the rage breaking the law was okay. Pretty good. Um, so it's funny. I, I, um, 
I have that sort of corrected for me, like Charlie Benanti, I think, and Marty Friedman just rave about British Steel and, and the quality of the songwriting. Right. Um, so they they you know, these are rock stars who are actually doing it rather than me, who's like a nobody. Um, but they're actually out there doing it and they're and they're trying to get the point across that pre songwriting improves so much. But even then. Uh, I will disagree with them on this whole idea, this this rarefied, you know, subjective thing about what is a great song. Right. But I do remember as a kid already being sophisticated enough at uh, what would I've been there? Uh, 17 years old. Um, I did feel that about Grinder and Metal Gods. I felt like, OK. These are two of Priest's best songs. I don't know what's great about them, but they just seem to be better songwriting than the albums I liked previous. They aren't particularly complicated, but they're complicated enough, blah, 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 crossed with the great songwriting thing. So um, everything that that basically Marty Friedman and Charlie Benante, you know, rave about British Steel and call it a drop dead classic. I, I, I under totally understand what they're talking about, but for, for me, that coalesces in two songs and then maybe half into breaking the law, which I think is also a great song. But I don't think you have to be old, too old to be or wise or rage or certainly, certainly rapid fire and sealer, not well-written songs at all. And living after midnight. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. But um, I, I do. I'll always remember thinking of that about the, the one improvement priest made in 1980 was, metal gods and grinder did they open for kiss prior to that what wasn't that they opened for kiss uh, in yeah 79? i think they did uh i always get it comp uh confused with iron maiden um but well, i think they both that, did yeah i think they it, did perhaps they i i okay so there's I a think, reason i'm asking i'm gonna i'm yeah. setting up a question here yeah i think they did on on um in 79 and 80 okay uh, and i think uh maiden did in 80 and 81 maybe Something all right because I was listening to Three Sides of the Coin, the KISS podcast, and you've been on. Mm -hmm. And Mark Cicchini had brought up an interesting point about that maybe that influenced the songwriting. I think he cited Living After Midnight was kind of like their rock and roll all night. Like they were looking for a song like that. You know, maybe that influenced. That's a great idea. That's a great theory. But I've never heard them say anything like that. Yeah. I mean, it would be a great question to ask them. But I think they were just influenced somewhat by Tom Allen, somewhat by getting Dave Holland in the band and seeing what kind of drummer he was and somewhat by just starving and needing some hits. And uh, and just, you know, I, I think it's Tom Allen who really kind of gave them the sermon on straightening out their songs kind of thing. I think he had a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah, the, the kiss thing is kind of interesting that that could that could be the case. Um, but uh that yeah, was the dynasty just, tour that they opened for kiss then? yeah yeah i guess um I, I i think they just needed to um you know everything they were doing was kind of going over people's heads put it that way unless you were a raging metal head like i say i mean they they you know the unsung story is that they're they're kind of like the beatles for for thrash artists right they they were like a super super uh, relevatory wow this is some great new music coming out Book on Rock Podcast. We'll be back after this. Difficult to see. Always in motion is the future. Martin Popoff here to talk about his latest book, Judas Priest, album by album. I was really curious to read the chapter on 1986's Terrible Album and see what people thought of that one. But before that is Point of Entry from 81, Screaming for Vengeance in 82, Defenders of Faith from 84. They chart at number 14, 11, and 19, respectively. Heading out to the highway, you've got another thing coming. Yeah, they're at the peak of their commercial popularity here. I want to ask you about Screaming for Vengeance because you have some great quotes from Slash on this album. He told you that this is his all-time favorite Priest record. He says, quote, it was just a motherfucker of a record. Everything Judas Priest peaks on that record. What do you think about Slash's comments? Do you agree with the statement that the, the band is peaking on that record? Yeah, I remember getting that album and thinking uh, the one side had, again, some great heavier songs than were even on point of entry. And uh, that was a great side of music. But the other side was kind of a uh, proto hair metal. We didn't know hair metal existed. It didn't exist at the time, but it, but it was pretty kiss like still. Um, so I, I think they were somewhat kiss like uh, across all three and maybe even into four, maybe even five of those albums, actually. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I've, I've seen a lot of kind of deep priest fans say this over recent years too, saying screaming for vengeance, a little overrated. Right. And I, I kind of believe that as well. Um, you know, um, it, it definitely felt uh, more dynamic and more exciting um, than um, point of entry. Uh, I think everything felt better at the time over point of entry over time. I've uh, point of entry is coming up for me a little bit. And then, and then the next album was heavier and darker still. And it was pretty cool. And I remember never really worrying or caring about the production, but now I hate the production on defenders. I, I, it's hard to listen to that album. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the songs were heavier still. So that was good. They were doubling down kind of thing. A lot of great riffs, a lot of great ideas still on those albums. There's, there's a lot to gather up and enjoy on all four of those albums, British steel, right through to those albums. And then, like you say, you get to turbo and we were all very shocked about turbo. <laughs> uh, but you know, nowadays, um, I actually quite like the production on it. I don't mind the idea of guitar since there's obviously the, the three or four songs that everybody absolutely hates on their parental guidance, private property, all those ones rock you all around the world whatever uh, but uh, but i like um i like locked in i think turbo lovers an absolute masterpiece yeah and locked great, in yeah well uh, put together so i agree yeah reckless i love reckless reckless chords and reckless yeah i'm so, a fan of turbo so, yeah, yeah it's, i think it's, it's my age though because i'm an 80s kid mm -hmm. you know yeah, it's it's a pretty good album i i'm 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 fine with it um but yeah they they were trying the hair metal thing the, the look is much more ridiculous than the record that's when they all got the you know the curly hair and the perms and the and added more red leather into their black leather and all that kind of thing right yeah, uh, yeah. well you say ju jump forward 20 years and it's a case of being glad this chapter in priest history was written so yeah that's a it, that's an interesting idea where i where i you know over a whole bunch of years when you look back on catalogs you you like that the band tried different things and has all these peaks of val and valleys it gives you more stuff to talk about right metallica is a great example of that with with load and saint anger and all that like all the very the all the different kinds of productions you get out of metallica right so uh you know and we have a problem with motorhead like that i mean motorhead the quality was always consistently high through the 2000s but it's hard to tell those albums apart um there's really really not a lot of variation there right just a lot of good ideas all clumped together you know every 18 months a new album comes out or whatever but yeah it's it's good to see that priest uh, did all that stuff and it and turbo really gives the fans something to talk about i mean people have just not stopped talking about turbo since it charted at number 33 top 40 album so mm -hmm. did well only one more album in the 80s, that's 88's Ram It Down, which reached number 24, a cover of Johnny Be Good on this album. Dave Holland replaced by Program Drums. Yeah. <laughs> Reading that would make you think that you would have trashed this album, but you say it has its moments. Yeah, and we never knew at the time it had Program Drums, and it's, yeah, it's, it's heavy again. Um, I, I think the production's better than on Defenders, and it's got some good ideas. But by that point, you know, you're really getting tired, or I'm getting tired of the heavy metal lyrics. I think the lyrics are not good on it. Um, and uh, yeah, pr pretty pretty decent album, and I believe it it went gold. It, it even managed to go gold. What about Painkiller, 1990? You write in the book often cited as the greatest Priest album. Do you agree? No, I mean uh, a lot. Of, that's that's one where uh, a lot of younger Priest fans love that album to death. They really do think it's one of the greatest Priest albums. But to me, I th I think I think it still falls down on the lyrics. I think the lyrics are too metal or than thou uh, on it. They're they're just kind of silly and primary colored. But uh, yeah, obviously the the playing is amazing on it. The production's great. That that really steely bright Chris Tangerini sound. You get Scott Travis coming in uh, on drums. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a I don't know. It's it's uh, those two albums are are both kind of parody of heavy metal albums in a way, right? They're just too locked into the whole idea of the ethos of heavy metal. The title track, A Touch of Evil, those are the singles off of Painkiller, reached number 26 on Billboard. Seven years go by before we get the next Judas Priest album, Jugulator, with a brand new singer, Ripper Owens. They followed with 2001's Demolition. Your thoughts on the Ripper Owens era? Yeah, I was not really much of a fan of those records. Just too heavy, too non-melodic, too uh, too uh, manly. Uh, you know, just too a lot of violence and blood and slashing and killing. They're like slasher slasher movie albums in a way, right? Um, but yeah, I just I, it, that that uh, that sort of style didn't didn't fit too well. I mean, none of this is Ripper's fault either because he wasn't doing the writing. Um, you know, and it's it's kind of. Um, it's kind of reinforced with the uh, 
the similarity in the album covers and just having, you know, that red all the time, um, the Judas Priest red. So yeah, just not, not much to love on those records. They're just, they're just too rough and abrasive. How about Halford's solo career? Were you, did you prefer his work? Over the yeah, I was totally into his stuff. Uh, you know, you had you know, Fight was an interesting band, uh, Two wasn't so great. That was his industrial kind of look, but they but the Halford band uh made some amazing music, very traditional priesty kind of music. Uh, I really like that second fight album more than the first one. Most people like War of Words best, but yeah, it's and and I I even did a history in five songs episode on on Rob and and Bruce as as doppelgangers because they both go away and do some interesting work on their own because I think in both cases they're looking at their band and saying this is getting a little cheesy uh, at this point right and they're saying I, I want to write some music for adults right and and keep it in a metal zone so they both went away and did that which I remember hearing great things about Halford's solo career not that I didn't not that I heard bad things about Dickinson but I, I remember just yeah. Just got out there like, yeah, Halford's the real deal. He's got some good stuff on the side. But of course, everybody wanted to see him back with priests, and he did return. That was 2005's Angel of Retribution, number 30. Then the numbers only get higher from there. 2014's Redeemer of Souls, number 12. 2018's Firepower, number 5. 2024's Invincible Shield, all the way to number 2. You lead the chapter. Yeah, on the Invin numbers mean nothing, though, yeah. at, at, in later years. Later like, years. Like, yeah. Yeah. They, they always start at they start at the top and then they quickly uh, fall. But the popularity of Priest is as strong as ever. And you lead the chapter on Invincible Shield by saying, quote, it's hard to believe Priest could be this vital up until their 19th album and fully six years after Firepower. But here they are. They're still kicking ass. So well, what is your assessment of Priest of recent years? Oh, it's amazing. I think Priest's doing a, a killer, killer job. Uh, Richie Faulkner's a big part of that, of course, as well. Um, the productions are amazing, very molten guitars. Um, you know, Andy Sneap is super important to the band as well. But uh, yeah, I people love Invincible Shield. I love it too. There's great riffs on it. It's it's proggy in places. It's got, you know, um, a little odd time signature stuff going on, but the, the riffs are really exciting. All the writing is good. So yeah, people are loving Priest now. Um, they're just an iconic classic rock band. Um, they're still touring. Halford is unbelievably still singing quite yeah. well. You know, it's up and down a little bit, right? He's getting a little older, but he's singing really well. There's there's a lot of examples of guys that are doing a lot worse than he is. Uh, they were even younger than him. And he's got a heavy job to do. It's it's a it's a pretty acrobatic kind of singing that he does, right? He's in his so, 70s now, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's he's doing well. Um, and, uh, yeah, pe people love these albums. People loved firepower when it came out as well. Uh, Redeemer of souls is a funny one. I I've often thought, uh, you know, my point that I make in the book is that it, it, uh, it has this strange arcane production values that you get on Glenn Tipton's, uh, uh, baptism of fire and on Nostradamus. So, so it's interesting. There's this trilogy of albums that I think kind of go together. Those three that have uh, this, this oddly synthetic drum sound, these, these uh, sort of synthesizer -y sounding guitars that Glenn, Glenn kind of liked that at the time. So it's, so again, it's neat that a redeemer of souls exists and it's very, very different from firepower, which is kind of similar to invincible, invincible shield. But the, the point I, I don't know if I made this in the book, but I, but in reviewing the album, it's like every single, it's almost like every single song on invincible shield is like a better version of something that might have been on firepower, but firepower was amazing to begin with. So the bar is just really high. It's I I think they've done a really good job uh, in recent years in keep keeping keeping the priest flame alive. Book on Rock Podcast. We'll be back after this. I think you'd be glad later if you weren't here now. So we'll finish with a quick rapid fire series of questions, starting with best Judas Priest album. I'd say Killing Machine, Hellbent. Okay. Yeah. Most underrated Priest album. Wow, that's a good one. Underrated. Underrated. See, I, I did a whole podcast episode on the meaning of the word underrated. And that that really, it's a really loaded word, right? Right. Yes. Because things that can be that that can be rated super, super high can be uh hang hang on how does that work so so if if some yeah okay uh, underrated or overrated over right? if, yeah yeah if something is rated super super high it could still be great but still be overrated i guess because i think of underrated is overlooked too like people yeah underrated um point of entry although people now are starting to realize what a 
cool, fun, well-written album that is. I think there's some good songwriting on that album. Yeah, that's that's one where I can okay. see that argument. That all I could almost see that argument of Charlie and Marty applying even more on point of entry. So that's underrated to me. Uh, rock and roll is underrated. Um, I think I think that's just gotten a bad rap over the years, and it's really good, especially for like I say, being a baby band on no budget. I I think it's underrated. Um, what else is underrated? I think Redeemer of Souls uh, over the years is going to be seen to be an underrated album because it is a little out there. It's a little bit different. Um, so Would you say you Turbo is underrated? Turbo, underrated. Um, Got some good songs on yeah, it. Yeah, you're so right. Shouldn't... I mean, it, it, is, it is quite reviled. So for that reason, it's underrated. I, I don't think it's a super amazing album. Um, but I also, the problem, I, I guess, in, in me overlooking that as underrated is I, I see too many people loving it to death. Um, so it, it's it's starting to be rated a little too high almost. <laughs> okay, well, that's where I was yeah. going to go. Most overrated Priest album. What do you think, Turbo? Uh, overrated. <laughs> uh, Screaming for Vengeance. Yeah. I, I think that's overrated the same way that Number of the Beast is overrated because it's rated so highly um, and people, when you drill down, there's some, there's some slightly dodgy material on it. Um, what else? Painkiller, I think is overrated uh, because that is rated super, super high. And I think, like I say, I think the, the lyrics are just juvenile on it. Uh, and, and I can't, I can't unsee the lyrics. Um, so yeah, there's two good ones. All right. How about we didn't talk album covers, best priest album cover. Boy. Um, Sad wings of destiny is amazing. Killing Machine is amazing. After that, they get pretty metal. They get pretty straightforward and metal and illustrated. So I, I think you lose the art. You lose the, I mean, point of entry is kind of artistic, but I think you lose the art forevermore. When, once Priest becomes mortals, that's what happens, right? Priest, priest are immortal to me. They're like gods. They're like geniuses up until Killing Machine. And once they become mortal, their album be, album covers also become mortal. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know what? I, I'm going to go Killing Machine even over Sad Wings because Sad Wings is a little too on the nose. And, hey, this is a beautifully illustrated, classic, symbolist kind of painting. Uh, but Killing Machine is, is really kind of artistic and cool and really makes an impact. All right, winding down here, if you had to introduce somebody who's never heard of Judas Priest before, what song would it be? Best pre-song to introduce a fan to? Wow. Um, this is always a question that uh, that bothers me um, because we always do this with albums or pick five songs to introduce. A, because this band has so many different eras and uh, you'd almost have to gauge how old is the is this fan you're trying to get them into priest. Um, so everybody's different. But, um, you know, for best priest song, I often go with delivering the goods. Um, but best song to introduce a fan to let's just let's just say it's a 22 year old fan say say you're trying to spoon feed metal to to a to a kid that's into uh hip hop say right yeah uh, you want to get a you don't want to you want to corrupt him into being a metalhead you'd have to go with something newer and shinier right so uh so yeah yeah, trial by fire, maybe. Okay, Something I was. Gonna, I thought you were gonna say living after midnight. Super that's that's new. an entry entrance. No, song. you know what? And if you got a twenty-two year old kid, music sounding that old is just gonna sound clanky and yeah. crappy, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. you got to go with something that that gives you all the production values. Uh, you know, Invincible Shield, maybe. Yeah. Metal track. Yeah. Is is uh, living after midnight Priest's most overrated song? Now we're getting uh, overrated I don't think it's and underrated. Rated that high, uh, overrated song. Okay, so Bruce Priest overrated song. Um, let's see. Um, you know, Breaking you the got law. Another thing coming is not that rated that highly. Breaking the law is rated pretty highly. Yeah, breaking the law might be a little overrated. Um, what what else? I think Beavis and Butt. Okay, made I that got song it. Pain, painkiller. The song painkiller okay. is the most overrated priest song. All right, and then finally, most underrated priest song. What do you think it is? I think well, OK, I've got a perfect answer for that, because I always get heck for calling this my second favorite priest song, Burning Up from mm. Killing Machine. Uh, people think that song is commercial and disco and funky and blah, blah, blah. I, I think it's beautifully, beautifully written. It's I think it's heavy as hell. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it. So there you go. Most there you go. There you go. Judas Priest album by album. It's out now. I'm assuming people can go to your website, too, if they want a signed copy. Do you yep. 
Okay. Exactly. I've been uh, I've been signing and sending them out. Yeah. I mean, my you know, most of my income is being a mail order guy, my own books. Right. So, yeah, martinpopoff.com, anything that's in print. I have copies. I sign them, send them out from here. So postage is reasonable. PayPal buttons for everything. And uh, off you go. And then anything else you want to plug the, the shows on YouTube? Well, like I said, I've got my songs. audio podcast every week, History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff. We've got our Contrarians video channel. Uh, I do a podcast uh, also on Pantheon with John Gaffney called uh, Kicked in the Teeth, an ACDC podcast. Um, yeah, that's about it. Busy. Always busy. All right, Martin, thanks. We will talk to you again down the road. All right. Sounds good, Eric. That's it. It's in the books.